Coming up on today's episode of Spybury, we chat with intelligence expert Nigel West. Been dying to get Nigel on the show for a very long time. We dig into his latest book, Spies Who Changed History. And it's not the familiar faces. He profiles 14 spies. I only knew two or three of them. So this is an excellent book. We find out more in this ep- in this episode. Nigel also kindly answers your questions. Yes, I asked you for questions for Nigel. And uh, we, we cover a lot of different topics from what was it like to meet Anthony Blunt, one of the Cambridge Five. What's his view on the Steele dossier? Yeah, we get a bit political on this episode. We talk about Peter Wright and Spycatcher and also about Garbo and also about Nigel's forward to the Sandbaggers. All that and more coming up on episode 195 of the Spybury Podcast. Do you love spy books, movies, and TV? Then the Spybury Podcast is for you. Since 2017, host Shane Whaley and Spybury field agents around the world dispatch reviews and interviews with authors, historians, and fellow spy fans. We discuss everything from John le Carre, Len Dayton, Paul Vidich, Graham Greene, Nick Heron, Charles Cumming, Ben McIntyre, and many more. Spybury is available on all good podcast apps and at spybury.com. Welcome to Spybury, episode 195, to our very special guest, intelligence historian, Nigel West. How are you, sir? So far, so good, unless you know better. (laughs) Well, uh, thank you very much for for joining us today. I'm going to say that the vast majority of our listeners and our Spybury community are well aware of your work. I know I was just looking at my shelf. I've got a Nigel West shelf in my Spybury, and there's a dozen books there, which I thought was good going. But when I did a little bit of research, I see um, you've written almost 40 books. I think it was 37 when I totted them up from your website. So I've got some way to go here, Nigel. I'm afraid so. I think the only person who really takes a account of how many books I write is my ex-wife. <laughs> Excellent. So without a doubt, you are the expert's expert. You are the dean of espionage history. How did you first get interested in writing about intelligence, espionage, security matters? Uh, I suppose I was interested at school. I read a book by Sigismund Payne Best, who I subsequently met, who was a British SIS officer who was abducted in Venlo on the Dutch border in November 1939 and spent the war in a concentration camp. And he wrote a book in about 1954 called The Venlo Incident. And he, although he was an SIS officer, he was immensely discreet about all the other personnel, all all names of all his colleagues. And so it was full of Captain X and, and Mr. Z and Captain W. And I found this really profoundly irritating. And that at that time, it was considered to be akin to lack of patriotism to discuss these topics publicly. And so that inspired me to to try and find the people involved and to talk to them and to use their real names where possible. And I think the other big influence for me was, again, when I was at school, I was educated in a Benedictine monastery. And one of the monks was uh, his non his original name, his non-religious name was Anthony Coombe Tennant. And he had been an SIS officer. And he had taken holy orders in about 1961. He left SIS, as quite a few people at that time did take holy orders. And he would tell the boys at an impressionable age, fascinating stories about his own experiences in SIS and his great friend who would drive past the school from time to time at weekends was John le Carre. And so David Cornwall would pop in and give impromptu talks to boys selected by uh, Anthony Coombe Tennant. And on that basis, a group of us 
took a healthy or unhealthy, depending upon your viewpoint, interest in the intelligence community. And that persuaded me that there was so much to be said that had never been recorded by these very remarkable people who appeared perfectly willing to talk, provided they'd been approached in the right way. Were you ever then interested? Did they ever plant the seed that, hey, I, I would like to work in the intelligence services? Well, unfortunately, I was just too inquisitive. Uh, the difficulty about working inside an intelligence organization as a professional, as an officer, is that you are very highly circumvented in what you can say and do and read. And I remember going to a dinner party and meeting a woman who eventually admitted she worked for MI5. And I said, which, which, which section do you work in MI5? And she was a long silence and she said, uh, F2. And I said, oh, how interesting. Um, you're involved with agents being run against the Communist Party of Great Britain, are you? And she said, how do you know that? <laughs> you're, you're not a member of the organization. You're not supposed to know that. And I said, well, I've studied the organization. I know lots of people, and I've spoken to many, many agents. And she said, well, do tell me, what does D1 do? Because I've always wondered. Brilliant. So it, it, there used to be this, this term in America of, I think it was um, smokestacking or something of that kind. It, it meant that people were so compartmented that they didn't know what people on the other side of the corridor was doing. And there may have been an overlap and there may have been uh, a community of interest that um, the stovepiping mm -hmm. um, that meant that these organizations operated in isolation as though other organizations weren't in possession of the relevant facts. Of course, this was a time when you were starting to research intelligence services when, I don't want to age you here, Nigel, but there was no internet, right? It wasn't as easy as going on Google and tracking down documents. I mean, you had to go probably through old phone directories and all sorts to track people down. The, the telephone directory was the best intelligence resource of all time. There was no such word as declassification. The idea, if, if we had had this conversation in 1977, or, or even for that matter, in 1987, and uh, you said, are you going down to the National Archives to take a look at the declassified files? Or if you, if you had said to me, do you realize last week 147 additional MI5 files were uh, deposited in the archive that already held 6,500 files, I would have said raving mad. The, the reason why these intelligence officers wrote what they did in their files was because they were absolutely confident that only the addressee would ever see that letter. There was no prospect of declassification or it being made public uh, or people like me being able to go on the internet and download the original material. It, it, it's, it was inconceivable. Yeah, absolutely. And just having this access to the World Wide Web for, for its good and its bad is just, you know, I, I just respect you for what you did back then without having that, that resource at your fingertips. And, you know, well, kids... I, I, I wouldn't get too carried away because the, the first two authors that I worked for when I was at university were both intelligence officers and both were scoundrels. <laughs> um, Richard Deacon, whose real name was Donald McCormick, was not beyond inventing sources for himself. And I discovered that Ronnie Seth, who was a former SOE agent, who had been sentenced to death in Silesia after he had been captured by the Nazis, he was an amateur pornographer um, that, that had invented a, uh, a penis extension method. Uh, I'm just bizarre. So uh, there were aspects to this work that was very unappealing yeah and, and you wrote a book right with the counterfeit spies was it where you outed some of these folks who said they they had been doing stuff that they had not yes after my first 10 years i realized that so much nonsense had been written so many journalists had invented stories or or 
linked up two completely separate events and created a, a myth. But I put a pile of books on one side, knowing that they were completely unreliable. And before I knew what was happening, there were 25 of these books. And most of them involved people who claimed that they had gone into enemy-occupied territory and had participated in clandestine operations when they most certainly hadn't. A couple of them had actually been in prison during the war. <laughs> so Walter Mitty types then. Yes, and, and some of these people, I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned Walter Mitty because I think that some of these people would have passed a polygraph and, and genuinely believed in their lies. They, they really thought they'd done what they had done. I mean, there were other people who clearly knew that they were faking material or putting fake captions on photographs, or as in the example of William Stevenson and a man called Intrepid, just took a movie that was made after the war and freeze-framed individual frames of the film and claimed that these were pictures made um, and, uh, and recovered from a secret wartime archive. Well, talking of books, um, I want to dig into your latest, which I was really excited to discover that you have three books coming out. Or actually, two are out, right? So the one we're going to talk about, particularly today, is Spies Who Change History. And uh, I actually put a little video talking of internet uh, on TikTok. First time I'd ever really put a video on TikTok where I wanted to let people know... Um, Spies Who Changed History is very different from Seven Spies Who Changed the World. So this was a question in our community. Um, Spies Who Changed History, how, how did this come about? What was the inspiration behind writing this one, Nigel? Uh, I was commissioned to, to write it, and I was invited to, to choose a dozen or so spies uh, and, and write about them. And I was given great latitude, and I said to the publishers, I'll do it but I've got conditions. I need to be able to have complete freedom to choose the, the agents. I want to choose agents that most people have never heard of. They probably haven't been written about. They're not going to be the usual suspects. And I want to be able to demonstrate that each of these individuals really made a, a significant impact, really made a difference. And so I was able to go uh, and get material. For example, I found Kim Philby's original typed um, confession. Uh, I talked to Vladimir Kazichkin, who revealed the, the Soviet plot to run a coup in Iran and take over the whole of the Iranian oil fields uh, in 1983. Um, the Ashraf Marwan case, where an um, President Nasser's son-in-law sold out to Mossad and was then defenestrated uh, out of a window in London. Uh, these were really unusual, interesting cases that most people would not have come across. And I wanted to show how these cases were, were really significant, or, or in the case of Walter Duve, actually created a new intelligence discipline. In his case, it was train watching. Yeah, I, I have to say, when I, when I first got the book, I was a little bit embarrassed because I thought, oh, wow, I, I, I probably only know one or two of these names. But, so but that's great. That, that's, <laughs> you're, you're my ideal audience then. Yes. What I want is somebody who is not necessarily a part of the cognoscenti, but they're people who are well-informed. And I hope that they will, on every chapter, they'll find something that is absolutely unusual, brand new to them. And I did. And, you know, I, I posted in our online community that this is a book that, yes, will appeal to academics, but also people like myself who have a passing interest in espionage history. And also, I, I would say, to fiction writers, because what I always say, Nigel, is spy fact is often stranger than spy fiction. And I feel that particularly writers who are starting out can be very inspired by some of the people you've written about here, um, some of the, the circumstances, the situations, the escapades, and could go and riff off these ideas and say, inspire them to write a work of fiction as well. So I think your work does appeal um, to lots of different constituencies within the world of spy. Um, so, yeah, I, when I read the book, 
as I say, I, I wasn't familiar with most of them. Um, I love the photographs you included. Uh, and especially, uh, I wasn't aware of Christopher Draper, the air ace. And I love the photograph you included of him flying underneath bridges over the River Thames in London to demonstrate. So rather than throw stuff at paintings back in the day, <laughs> they were flying under bridges to protest. Uh, Christopher Draper is in, of enormous significance because he was a double agent. He was one of the very first double agents run against the Germans, really from 1933, when he started being cultivated by the Abwehr. And he, he really proved a very important point, and that was that unless you have a system of managing double agents and you get the authority to provide them with classified information that will retain the interest of their controllers, you're going to lose the case. And Christopher Draper was an enthusiastic double agent. He was well run. He had good uh, relationship with the Abwehr, but the Abwehr just abandoned him. Why? Because they got bored with the information that he was providing. They, they gave him uh, questionnaires of what they were interested in, and he couldn't fulfill the task. And there were two consequences of that. One was that the, the Germans just abandoned him. So the case lapsed. And, and that's pretty irritating after you've made a, a significant investment and he's put his life at risk by traveling to Germany and so on. The second is that you lose an income stream because Christopher Draper was being paid uh, by the Germans. And thirdly, what will the Germans do if they, if they lose their source, they'll just go and recruit others that you haven't already got under control and you have to start the cycle all over again. So Christopher Draper, in many ways, taught MI5 a very important lesson, and that was that you have to coordinate the intelligence agencies of the various different armed services and to persuade them that it's worth them sacrificing a bit of chicken feed some good information that is authentic, that can be verified and pass that to a potential enemy. And that was the, the origins of the double cross system, which didn't begin until January 1941. So uh, there was a, a long time from the loss of Christopher Draper to the development of a management system within the British security and intelligence apparatus to run, manage, uh, and maintain double agents uh, in, a, in a very well-organized, coordinated way. You've profiled 14 spies here in the book. And, and what I especially like is you've covered different eras of the, of the last century. So you've covered First World War, Second World War, Cold War, and even post-Cold War with uh, um, Gennady Vasilenko, who was the... Uh, who facilitated the detection of Ames and Hansen. Yeah, I mean, Gennady is a, he's, he's very much alive, um, but he's obviously in the defector resettlement program. Um, and he is of enormous significance because he was recruited by the CIA in 1979. And he was uh, the person behind, as you say, um, the uh, identification uh, and the uh, arrest of Bob Hansen um, and Rick Ames. So he, he was of great significance, but more importantly, in 2010, he was the motive for the spy exchange in Vienna when all the Russian illegals were caught in the United States. I've spoken to one of the senior FBI officers who was involved in rolling up that case, who spent a, a substantial portion of his life uh, involved in that 10 years of surveillance of the, um, uh, the, the Russian illegals uh, in the so-called ghost stories operation. And even he didn't know, he said, genuinely, I don't know what the motivation was to roll up the, the organization. There were stories that, that one of the agents was getting too close to Hillary Clinton. 
Uh, there were other stories that um, a couple of them were, were due to go on vacation and they'd be lost. The real truth was that the CIA wanted to get Gennady out of jail. Mm. They thought Gennady was going to die in jail. Gennady thought he was going to die in jail. And his son appealed to Gennady's CIA case officer, a man called Jack Platt, great man. And Jack Platt applied pressure on the senior management at the CIA and said, you've got to get this guy out. And the CIA, it's really good for business. If you look after your agents and if you exfiltrate them, this was done with great skill. But of course, we're paying the consequences because uh, Vladimir Putin was obviously duped about this uh, operation, and he's clearly rather irritated. Yeah, and I mean, you. There was a book. In fact, our, our most recent interview with a lady called Liz Wheel. She wrote a book on Bob Hansen, and it was only a passing reference um, to this this asset. So I was glad with your chapter that you were able to kind of give me more color. It was kind of in her book was like a guy who took a ton of money and was a businessman. But you you go into much more detail in this. So uh, yeah, well, that that was Gennady's business partner. Ah, okay. So you're you're good. Uh, Sorry, carry Alexander on. Alexander Sherbakov. Ah, I got it. So I got those mixed up. Um, and, and Sherbakov, um, but but Sher- Sherbakov was introduced to the FBI and the CIA by Gennady. Gennady was was the guy behind Zaporovsky. Uh, Zaporovsky was uh, became the CIA's source within uh, Group North which was the organization that was trying to recruit um, people in the FBI and, and the CIA and demonstrably was hugely successful. Absolutely. Well, I, I, I like getting schooled by you, Nigel. It's very important <laughs> uh, to get the true facts here. And I, I remember you wrote to me some time ago, I think you'd heard one of our past episodes and you'd said, uh, I forget who we were talking about, but you said he wasn't a double agent. He was a penetration agent. Um, for our listeners, could you could you talk about the differences between the two? Yes, there's, there's a, a great misunderstanding, even within, I'm afraid, some areas of the um, intelligence community itself, that a, a double agent is somebody who's who is turned against his original controller, um, and a penetration agent is a straightforward agent who goes and. Uh, is loyal to his or her controller. And even if they work for uh, an intelligence agency, that doesn't make them a double agent. The fact that you work for three or four different intelligence agencies, uh, like Renato Levy, who was codenamed Cheese by the British uh, and was uh, Roberto to the Germans and the Italians in the Second World War, he was a double agent. Uh, he was He was not... Uh, a penetration agent. Kim Philby, on the other hand, was a straight penetration agent. George Blake was a straight penetration agent. Rick Ames, Hansen, they were not double agents. If you say that Bob Hansen was a double agent, what you're saying is he was controlled by the Americans yeah. and was loyal to the United States, which we know to be untrue. Absolutely. Um, so there's 14 spies you profiled here. Obviously, we don't have time to go into all of them. One of the one of them, so Olga Gray, what moved me was reading about, well, maybe you can share a little bit about Olga Gray and what she did, and I'll share with you what, what moved me about her story. Well, the, the security service has never really been given the credit for one aspect of its work, which is based on a curiosity within the Communist Party of Great Britain. And it was the same in CPUSA. In order to join CPGB, Uh, We now know that candidates, their names and their details and their uh, proof of their loyalty were vetted, not in the United Kingdom, but in Moscow, in the Kremlin. So the only way that you could join CPGB uh, without going through that vetting process was to have been a member of the Young Communist League. So when you reached uh, 17 or 18, depending upon when it was, uh, if you were YCL, you had a smooth transition. You went, you joined the senior party, CPUSA, CPGB. So the British 
the security service tried to circumvent this by recruiting children spies. And they recruited very young people to join YCL so that they would then morph into CPGB and they would become moles. And this was really great foresight that uh, this program was um, embarked upon. And part of that program of targeting CPGB for penetration was this uh, very remarkable woman, Olga Gray. And she joined CP, she joined a, a different organization, the Friends of the Soviet Union, initially. Then she joined CPGB. And she worked for Percy Glading, who was the national organizer. And she was also very close to the head of CPGB, a man called Harry Pollitt. And, and what makes Olga Gray so remarkable is that she wasn't just reporting from within the organization. She wasn't just confirming the identities of people whose, um, whose voices had been recorded on the listening apparatus that had been inserted into the CPGB headquarters. But most importantly of all, she, on a mission to India, where the Communist Party was banned, but nevertheless still existed uh, in an underground form, it was known to be communicating with Moscow and the CPGB was, was in direct radio contact with Moscow. And it was Olga Gray who produced the book code, which was Treasure Island, for the communications. Now, this had a dramatic impact because every night there was a clandestine shortwave radio station in Wimbledon in London that was transmitting to Moscow uh, cons this getting consent for changes in policy, discussing personalities, discussing polit political initiatives, and so on. And what this material, which, because of Olga Gray and applying the code that was contained in Treasure Island, it, was, it proved, first of all, that CPGB was not an, a legitimate political party, Secondly, it was an instrument of NKVD in Moscow. Thirdly, it showed that the organization was completely managed, um, trained, run, financed by Moscow Gold. And this was had a big impact, particularly on members of the Labour Party and Labour governments, when they were told that there is firm evidence, and it's codenamed MASK, we have firm evidence that CPGB is not like the Liberal Party or the Labour Party or the Tory Party. And that is very dramatic and, and I think has often been overlooked. Yeah, it's, it's a remarkable story. And I, I learned a lot through that. For instance, I didn't know that members had to be vetted by, by Moscow to be members of the party. Um, I think also what, what moved me was what happened to Olga Gray? So you wrote that she was given 500 quid and there we go. And um, she, she moved to Canada and was always quite fearful of, of her safety or for her safety. Yes, she, she was eventually turned over or, or publicly identified um, or where she was living was identified by a British journalist. And uh, she took to her bed after that. She was... Uh, very worried, very scared. Mm. Um, but it was a, a remarkable story, and I hope that I gave a, a different take, um, a sort of an insider's view of why Olga Gray was terribly important. She wasn't just the, the witness Miss X at an old Bailey espionage trial when Percy Glading and uh, three of his Confederates, accomplices, were prosecuted. She was the surprise witness that sent them to jail, but she was much more important than that. But unfortunately, having been a very successful penetration agent, that she had outlived her usefulness, and uh, she was therefore paid off, as you say, and went to live in Canada. So that's just a handful of the spies who make this book. Like I said, there's 14 uh, included. I'll add them all into the show notes, which you can find at spybury.com forward slash 195 and highly recommend reading The Spies Who Change History. Um, 
Other than this one, Nigel, of all your work, this is a bit like asking who your favorite child is, I guess, or favorite pet, but what, what work are you most proud of when you look back at your 37 books? What are you, which one are you most proud of? Um, uh, what I'm proud of is being able to go back to 1980 and to say these stories still stand up. Uh, I was accused a long time ago by a very nice Sunday Times journalist, Philip Knightley. He thought that my, by making a comparative analysis of the first book that I wrote about the security service, MI5, 1909 to 1945, he said it, it's so close, even in the chapter structure, is so close to the official history that you must have seen a draft of the official history beforehand. And I hadn't. It, it was just simply intellectually that the authors of the official history uh, looked at the problem of writing that history. And, in, and I followed the same, I came to the same independent conclusions. And even our, some of our chapter titles were very similar, but I never read it. What am I most proud of? Uh, I mean, far and away anything else, I'm most proud of finding Garbo in South America and bringing him to London in 1984, taking him to Buckingham Palace, having an investiture where he gets his medal, and he dies a few years later having written uh, a book about being one of only three wireless double agents on D-Day, and to have run uh, a, a network of 25 sub-agents who all existed in his head and having completely duped the advert. So uh, I'm most proud of that. Intellectually, the most fascinating was Venona. I'm re I remain really interested by the mysteries of Venona. And I was able to identify two really important spies uh, in, the, in the British GRU traffic uh, from the end of the Second World War. And I'm, I'm really proud of the work that I did on Venona. Um, but I think I'm only embarrassed probably by having misidentified Garbo uh, in the very early days. I, I got him wrong initially. Uh, and then I found, I found a, a different MI5 asset who was a Peruvian diplomat. And uh, I misidentified, he, he'd been given a medal but he was a different medal and he wasn't Garbo, but I got Garbo in the end. It took me a few years. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I love that story. I don't know if we'll have time to go into it now about how you, uh, you tracked him down and called him uh, kind of on behalf of the palace, wasn't it? That there was a medal waiting for him, uh, Nigel. <laughs> I'm sure I prom uh, you promised not to tell anybody that story. That's right. That's right. But I did hear that the Duke of Edinburgh was fascinated by spies, wasn't he? Yes. He, he was a great spy buff. And he liked uh, non-fiction intelligence stories. Uh, and he was really at the heart of my relationship with Garbo, because when eventually I latched onto the name Juan Pujol Garcia and found just such an individual in Caracas, uh, it, the only way that I could think of persuading somebody who had faked their life, protected themselves for decades had no apparent reason for ex revealing themselves the only way was to gamble and uh, so i i arranged to ask prince philip uh, whether he would agree to see garbo when he came to london on the 40th anniversary of the d-day landings and he was very enthusiastic i mean he said well everybody knows garbo's dead and uh, I said, no, 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 he's not, he's not dead. He's, he's not only alive, he's coming to London, um, which was a, a slight exaggeration. But it, that did enable me, his enthusiasm did enable me then to be able to ring Garbo and say I was calling from Buckingham Palace. And nobody refuses a call from Buckingham Palace. It's like the White House. So do you ever read spy fiction, Nigel? I, I try not to. Occasionally... Uh, I'm paid to read it um, in order to, if somebody wants to make it as authentic as possible. 
the publishers will commission me to to write a report and correct small slips, things of that kind. But generally speaking, uh, I don't. Partly, I'm resentful. I'm resentful of people who invent stories about spies when the real stories are so much better. Mm. And uh, I'm resentful, too, of the twisting uh, of facts. I, I find that very frustrating. And uh, it's, it's, conf- it's confusing. It's sort of a bear with a small brain. Let's just concentrate on what we really know to be true. Out of the spy fiction you have read, which author would you say describes let's say British intelligence, probably the closest, or the life of a spy, who do you think is is almost there in, in the way that they write about them? Uh, I, I think without doubt, um, Ashenden. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I think Willie Somerset Maugham, uh, who was himself uh, a professional intelligence officer. Uh, well, I perhaps I've exaggerated by saying that I disapprove of spy fiction. I love spy fiction where I'm told that the the author is himself, either is or was a member of the intelligence community, and better still, where the story is based on some piece of of fact. I, I wrote a historical dictionary about in Fleming's James Bond, the reason being that there was so much in Fleming, when you, when you read the books, not the movies, when you read the books, you can just see where this stuff comes from and you can recognise the names. And when uh, Bond adopts the alias of um, David Somerset in From Russia With Love, I knew David Somerset. I knew his wife, Caroline. And it turns out that they, that he had, David had actually kept a, a copy of the letter that he received from Ian Fleming saying, do you mind if I use your names uh, in my forthcoming book? And he was enchanted. Um, but that kind of fact I found fascinating. And the way that uh, Fleming introduced factual material that he had obtained from classified briefings, uh, particularly relating to Smersh, uh, which demonstrably had come from a briefing given by a defector uh, called uh, Grigory Tokov. And this was the first time that anybody knew about Smersh. And it, it is extraordinary. There is Ian Fleming picking up the story of Smersh and making it well-known throughout the world. So where there is fiction that has been written by somebody who was an insider, as Somerset Maugham was, and writing Ashenden, which is clearly based on his own experiences in Switzerland as an SIS officer in the First World War, that's fascinating. And, of course, don't forget that Fleming and Le Carre and all the others all refer to Ashenden um, and pay homage. It's interesting. Whenever I, I read good, what I consider good spy fiction is gritty, realistic. It's the last job I would ever want to do in the world is to be a spy. <laughs> you read these books and think, who would who would sign up for this? Really, um, one one of the I, one of my hopes is that one day somebody would write a biography of Ted Albury, um, the author who was a former spy. I think he has a very interesting story in it. And I think some time ago there, w- there was talk of it, but it went quiet. Well, you see, you see, was a spy. Um, Ted was in the intelligence corps. Uh, he was never a member of the security service or the secret intelligence service. Um, and, but I agree that there is a, a gritty realism in, in Ted's books. Um, but but I, there are other people... There is a a book uh, written by Alan Judd, who was himself a secret intelligence service officer and was personal assistant to the the chief. And and he wrote a book about a double agent who had been recruited by the the Soviets uh, upon the occupation of Berlin. 
And um, he very casually told me it's a true story. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Right. I have to get to, to readers' questions here because I knew this would happen. You and I could probably chat for hours, and I, and I want to be respectful of your time. Um, Rossa McPhillips, MBE, who served in the Intelligence Corps, one of our listeners and supporters, says, uh, after blazing a trail in this area of nonfiction, you will have made some conclusions on various espionage cases based on what was public knowledge at the time and through your own interviews as more and more files are revealed these days to show what really went on in these cases, do you find yourself reassessing your earlier conclusions on some of the subject area you've looked at? Or do you look back and go, I made a deductive leap back then and I was right? Oh, I'm, I'm shocked about the deductive leaps. Um, can I just tell you that this week I've been through every one of the Stephen Ward files uh, that have just been declassified by MI5. And this is an account of the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Profumo affair. And my mentor in the security service was a man called Arthur Martin. And when I was having a drink with him one evening, and I said, Arthur, you've spent 35 years as a mole hunter. Looking back over it, do you think that you ever really made a difference? in anything ever? And it was one of those cynical questions that you, you're you being deliberately provocative. And Arthur turned to me and he said, yes, I think bringing down the Macmillan government uh, was <laughs> achieving something. And so I went to read the, the Ward case files with my heart in my mouth because I had written in 1983 about the real story of how MI5 had recruited Stephen Ward, how Penkovsky had identified Eugenie Ivanov as a potential defector, how Christine Keeler and, and Ward were going to be used by an MI5 officer called Keith Wagstaff to engineer the defection of Ivanov. Uh, all of this was material that was never in the Denning report, was terribly secret. And it showed MI5 to have been running this operation that went terribly badly wrong because they had no idea that Christine Keeler was canoodling with Jack Profumo. And so my heart was in my mouth, as your correspondent suggests, when I read the files to see whether my version of events was, which was completely way out there. Nobody at the time had the slightest idea of Keith Wagstaff or his alias, Mr. Woods, uh, his involvement with Stephen Ward. It's all there in the files. And I found that absolutely fascinating. So it was great. Even Keith Wagstaff's name, which was uh, really quite sort of secret at the time, even it, it, it's, it's unredacted and then it's in the files. So I was delighted by that. And your correspondent's absolutely right. I'm reading these files to look back now and, and see what I wrote on those cases. Uh, Paul Hodges asks, probably an oft-asked question, but in his work liaison, liaisoning with espionage agents, what's the strangest experience he learned about to the extent that he didn't believe it and had to conduct due diligence to verify it actually happened? Well, uh, to my embarrassment, I went down to Arundel in Sussex to uh, interview Dick White, who had, was the only officer to head both MI5 and SIS. And I had been given a set of instructions on what to ask by my then employer, uh, Donald McCormick, Richard Deacon. And right at the end of the conversation, uh, I was to raise the issue of hostile penetration and mole hunts within MI5, which was a very, very sensitive subject uh, at that time. And I was worried about raising the issue with such a senior figure uh, over lunch. And he, he, he didn't bat an eyelid. I thought, I thought, this is absolutely amazing. He's willing to discuss mole hunts in MI5. Then, and he turned to me and he said, uh, have you got any 
anybody in mind for uh, the mo a mole inside MI5? And I had been briefed by Richard Deacon that Anthony Blunt had been uh, a Soviet spy, which I didn't believe for one moment. And the reason was that Anthony Blunt had been knighted, had, been, had received a knighthood years after the defections of Burgess and McLean, when clearly he had been investigated uh, as part of the potential member of the Cambridge Ring of Five. So, uh, to my amazement, um, uh, Dick White said to me, what candidates have you got? And I said, uh, the one person that I'd been briefed on was the Deputy Director General of MI5, who was a man called Graham Mitchell. So I said, I plucked up my courage and, and said, Graham Mitchell. And he stroked his chin and said, that was a very interesting case. I practically fell off my chair when, <laughs> when he said that. It was a very interesting case, um, but nothing was ever proved, you know. And I thought, my God, he's told me that the Deputy Director General of the Security Service was a spy suspect. And he said, who else have you got in mind? And I gulped and said, well, to hell with it. Uh, Anthony Blunt. And he said, ah, well, that's a very different case. And I thought, wow, he's confirming to me that Anthony Blunt was a Soviet spy. I, I can't believe it, and, I, and I, don't, I don't know why he's telling me this. And eventually, of course, uh, some years later, in 1979, uh, it was revealed that Anthony Blunt had indeed been a spy and had confessed in 1964, which I didn't know. And you've met Anthony Blunt, correct? Yes, I interviewed him at length uh, in 1981. How was he in person? Uh, I found him, uh, eventually, when I got to know him, quite sort of, I wouldn't say genial, but, but, but quite professional. When I first met him, uh, I went to see him on a Sunday morning uh, at his request. I, I, we'd been negotiating access for, for quite a while, and I was writing my history of the security service, the wartime history. And he, of course, was a, a vital part of that. And he agreed to see me. And when I came back late afternoon on Sunday afternoon, in, in my family, there's a tradition. You have a, a proper roast beef lunch on Sunday, family lunch uh, with Yorkshire pud and the rest. And when I came, very rare roast beef. And when I came home at about three o'clock in the afternoon, my wife said, lunch is ready, we're all set to go. I said, you know, I, I can't eat anything. I found it, I had such a disagreeable experience interviewing this traitor that I found it, I, I'm not going to be able to eat lunch. And for me not to be able to eat rare roast beef and Yorkshire pudding and um, uh, horseradish sauce is, is really quite telling. If you had a league table of spies that you absolutely despise and hate, who would be number one of that league table, Nigel? He's not a spy, but somebody who's done huge damage to the intelligence community to the point that no British prime minister can ever go to the House of Commons and say, you're going to have to trust me on this, but I've seen the intelligence and this is the decision that I've made. The, the person that I blame for having diminished the reputation of the intelligence community is um, Alastair Campbell, who was Tony Blair's press secretary, who manipulated the Joint Intelligence Committee, uh, who participated in the so-called sexing up of the Iran-Iraq Iraq weapons of mass destruction dossier, it was the reason given to the House of Commons why we went to war in Iran and Iraq. Uh, sorry, in Iraq. Uh, from an American perspective, we know that regime change was, of course, part of not just 
the policy of the administration, but the previous, the Clinton administration had passed the appropriate legislation in Congress uh, for regime change in Iraq. So there was no surprise there, but for the British to meddle in the Middle East uh, after the um, experience of, of 1956 and Suez was a big deal. And so I, I blame Alistair Campbell to this day. The chap who, who asked the previous question, um, Paul Hodges, he actually runs a community for a show that you have some affection for, a TV show called The Sandbaggers. And uh, I pulled up my copy here of uh, The Life and Mysterious Death of Ian McIntosh, which you, you wrote, wrote a wonderful foreword for. Is that for you one of the best TV series on Spies? Yes, I thought that was a terrific series. Um, it was written by, get this, a serving intelligence officer on the Ministry of Defence um, in, intelligence staff uh, who disappeared in mysterious circumstances. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, and it, I think it was lots of people disappear in small planes in Alaska. But that was an extraordinary event. Um, but, but Sandbaggers had a, an air of authenticity about them that were, that were really quite remarkable. Be careful when you go on the internet trying to find the, the Sandbaggers website, because if you go to Sandbaggers, it, it turns out to be Mississippi um, flood defences. <laughs> right, okay. Um, I, I did love the, the, the part you wrote uh, at the conclusion of your foreword, where you wrote, Neil Burnside, who ran the covert organization known as the Sandbaggers, had a rather impressive record of success, but surely he was an almost entirely fictional character, or was he? <laughs> <laughs> Very playful there. Um, <laughs> Jeff Quests asks, I'm curious about when it became common knowledge that MI6 operated its spies out of the embassy undercover of the Foreign Office. I've tried to track that down, but not had any luck. Oddly enough, I think that even before the war, when the Secret Intelligence Service adopted passport control officers uh, around the world as their stations. Um, that became an open secret, um, not least because the passport control officer in each country, in the way that we operated, would never be targeted against the host country. They, they acted in a liaison relationship. So... Um, the, the SIS station commander in Berlin, for example, Frank Foley, was declared to the Gestapo and had a relationship with the German authorities. And you would try and find uh, commonality. You'd try and find mutually advantageous targets. Uh, in Berlin, Frank Foley didn't operate against the Germans. He operated against the Soviets with the Germans. And that's the same... Um, uh, it's a policy that, that is very expedient uh, and, and very practical. And I don't think there's really ever been any great secrecy about the fact that diplomatic and consular cover is used or abused. Sure. Uh, Joan Kopczynski asks, since Nigel writes nonfiction, does he have his manuscripts vetted by British intelligence or the CIA? Uh, not the CIA, but um, I have, over many years, adopted a policy of showing the various different intelligence agencies what I'm what I'm writing about. Uh, and I well remember that in 1981, when I submitted the manuscript of my book on the security service to. Uh, MI5, I, they originally said, we're not interested. You, there's nothing that you can ever find out about us that um, will cause us any problem or embarrassment. Feel free. You're under no contractual obligation to do so. And I said, I feel an, an obligation to do so. They asked for 185 um, <laughs> redactions and the removal of an entire chapter, which I agreed to do which was uh, about MI5's wartime relationship with G2, the Irish intelligence service in the Republic. So um, one of my contemporaries, near contemporaries, 
in the in a Benedictine monastery in my youth was somebody who uh, was killed in Northern Ireland. And uh, I have always been very conscious that although he wasn't an intelligence officer, he was acting in an intelligence role as a liaison. And uh, Robert Nyrak had died a terrible death at the hands of the provisional IRA. And I just never want anybody ever to be able to say, uh, oh, it was an indiscretion or it was uh, Nigel's fault that uh, this particular thing happened. And so I don't want a Nyrak on my conscience, nor do I want an Ashraf Marwan. Marwan was defenestrated uh, exactly six weeks after his name was disclosed accidentally on the internet uh, by an Israeli high court judgment. Um, a clerk in the court pressed the wrong button and put an unredacted version of a judgment onto the internet, released it. And six weeks later, Marwan is thrown off his sixth floor balcony in London. Awful. Um, Holly Khan asks, crikey, here we go. What's Nigel's opinion on the alleged Wilson coup plots? I have a, an, an opinion about it, and that is that most of the people who've written about the subject have got it wrong. Uh, I ghosted Galitzin's, Anatoly Galitzin's memoirs and um, called Checkmate. It hasn't been published yet. Um, and what's fascinating is that Galitzin never said He's been completely misrepresented. He never said that Wilson was a Soviet spy. He said that the leader of an opposition group uh, in, a British, in a parliament somewhere in Western Europe had been assassinated in order to make way for a Soviet asset to take his place. And when uh, MI5 looked at that issue, the only person that they could find in Western Europe who had died in mysterious circumstances was Hugh Gateskill, who had been leader of the Labour Party. Uh, it was at, at about the right time. And Hugh Gateskill had died of um, a condition that women of childbearing age get, elderly gentlemen do not get. And... MI5 was confronted with the dilemma, do we investigate Harold Wilson on the basis that um, Hugh Gateskill was murdered, or should we, on the basis that he's prime minister, leave him alone? And so it, 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 wasn't, Gates, it wasn't Galitzin pointing the finger. It was MI5 doing a reasonable job of due diligence and concluding that whoever you are, you're not above being investigated. And that's why MI5 investigated uh, Harold Wilson. And they, they went to elaborate lengths, by the way, to, uh, to conceal uh, that it was Wilson um, who was under investigation. Uh, there, were, there were code names that, that protected the whole exercise. Um, and, they, and they never came to a conclusion about it. But it, it emphatically was not a small group of renegade MI5 officers trying to overthrow the government. Got it. Another question that I don't know how you answer it in the one or two sentences, but uh, I want to ask Nigel for his opinions on the Steele dossier. In his view, was it fact or fiction? It, not only was it fiction, uh, read my book, The Compromat Conspiracy. Uh, this was uh, an analysis that grew out of a study that I was hired to conduct. I was hired to write a counterintelligence analysis of the Steele dossier. And the Steele dossier is full of so many schoolboy errors. Uh, it's comical. So one particular source is identified on, on, in one document as an employee of the Ritz-Carlton in Moscow. On another occasion, he's an expert on cyber uh, warfare, and on another occasion, he emerges as having a detailed knowledge of money laundering by the, the, the Russians in uh, in Miami. I mean, this is, the, the, the errors in that in the 
material that we now know as the steel dossier. I've known Chris for more than 10 years, and it, it saddened me when I came to the conclusion that he was an outright fabricator. And once I started to research his background, well, the truth all came tumbling out, and that's to be found in the Compromat conspiracy. On that note, um, another one. What's, what's Nigel West's opinion of Peter Wright's spy catcher? Fact, fiction, paranoia? Well, and I am partly responsible for that book because I introduced Paul Greengrass, who wrote it, to Peter Wright. So I'd known Peter Wright for a long time, and I used to ring up Peter Wright and report on my meetings with, Peter, with Anthony Blunt. Uh, way back in 1981. I then introduced Paul Greengrass to uh, Peter Wright, but they didn't tell me that they were collaborating together. They got on so well that they were producing Spycatcher. And Spycatcher is a, a very remarkable book. Um, it's not letting any secrets out of the hat to tell you that all the code names in Spycatcher, which could have been changed, or could have been um, altered on security grounds are all authentic. And uh, I, personally, I, I don't think that Spycatcher did any great deal of damage, but it certainly brought MI5 kicking and screaming into the 20th century and made them produce an employment contract, which they'd never, hit, they'd never done hitherto. Marvellous. Well, well, thank you for taking the time to, to answer our listener questions. There's actually a lot more, but I, I know the hour is up. Um, I do want to uh, flag up uh, another book that's just uh, thudded onto my doormat by you, which is Hitler's Nest of Vipers, The Rise of the Abwehr. Um, and this is a two-volume set, correct, Nigel? Yes. Uh, it covers the period 1933 to 1945, and it's based on declassified British and American documents that um, were based on interrogation of... Germans uh, at the end of the Second World War. So it's a completely different perspective on the organization. It's a totally different kind of book to the book written, for example, by by David Kahn. I am not familiar with the advert at all, so I'm really excited to dive in and read this one. Not an easy read. None of my books are very, very detailed, but but a lot of surprises in there. But I have to say, The Spies Who Changed History was a very accessible read. There was still detail in it, so much so that I'm flying over to London next week, and I've noted some of the addresses, like the, the flat that Olga Gray got for the Communist Party in Holland Park. And I like to go on long walks when I'm in London, and I like to go to these places that, and even with Google, we talked about the internet earlier with Google Maps, you know, I look up the addresses online and look at these very nondescript, you know, apartments and houses and think, wow. What skullduggery went on there? Who'd have guessed? Every, every street, read Roy Berkeley's book, uh, A Spies London. It's, a, it's a walking tours in every district of London. Absolutely fascinating. Brilliant. I will, I will track that down before I leave. Um, where can people follow you online, Nigel? My only contribution is nigelwest.com, um, which, is, which includes uh, really all my books. Absolutely. I will add that to the show notes, which everyone can find at spybury.com forward slash 195. Thanks very much for coming on to the show, Nigel. I, I hope I haven't been too much of a fanboy, but I've been an admirer uh, of your work for such a long time that it's a real pleasure to host you on our podcast. You're very kind. I'm delighted to participate. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks for listening to the Spybrary Podcast. You don't have to wait for the next episode. Join the conversation happening now at facebook.com slash spybrary and on Twitter at spybrary.